episode 105 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 14th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and my listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Amanda in Louisiana, Tiki in Maryland, Marlena in Oregon, Darcy and Christy in Washington State. Christy was very kind to reach out, and I asked if I could share her letter. This is what Christy wrote. Thank you for your amazing podcast. This March, when our schools and libraries closed, I really miss talking books and libraries, so I began searching for a podcast on the topic. Luckily, I found you. You have been with me as I've cleaned up my garden this past year and for many, many Sunday walks. Your episodes have given me so much to think about. I'm already planning how to genrefy my biography section when we return, and I've loved how you've recently focused on life as a virtual librarian. I've shared your podcast with multiple colleagues and highlighted it as a must for students in the University of Washington Masters of Library Science program during a presentation this fall. No matter the age range of a topic, your podcast has provided both tangible resource and added depth to my online PLN. Christy, I am so appreciative, and your kind words have validated my efforts and have given me inspiration moving forward and looking ahead to 2021. I especially appreciate that you mentioned that the age range of the topics really isn't all that important. And I, especially for today's episode, virtual high school programming, even our guests will mention that so many of the, the strategies and resources can be applied and modified to suit a younger audiences in the middle school and elementary elementary school. And, you know, it just warms my heart because when you realize that school librarians are awfully picky about the kinds of things that we share with others when it comes to resources. So when Christy tells me that she shared this podcast with up and coming school librarians and, and, you know, with coworkers, it really does mean a great deal to me. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions either on Facebook, Twitter, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now, for today's episode, Virtual High School Programming, and my conversation with Tuesday Chambers. back to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Listeners, we were first introduced to Tuesday in episode 104 and our conversation on curbside pickup. Tuesday, I saw pictures of that on social that you posted. Friends, you need to see what a success this is. It's just visually, you can't believe it. Well, thank you. Um, I will say that if you have not heard the last podcast, I go quite on about community. And so um, I'm glad to see there's evidence. It's nice to connect that for people, what you hear and then what you see. So I would love to connect with followers um, who did get inspired by the last one and hear what you all are doing. Well, and I'm going to be the first to admit, you know, when I do my curbside checkout, the I am the face of the library. I'm also the only one out there. And you clearly are, you know, because I'm doing this after hours, I'm doing this in the, you know, uh, after school ends. And, and so, you know, I'm not pulling people to come join me because their day has ended. And you have clearly moved beyond that threshold. You're sort of, you're pulling people and saying, look, this is a perfect opportunity. And it's what, every two weeks. And Mm -hmm. it had a real community feel because you had kids pulling in and doing activities for you and you had volunteers. I mean, you, you mentioned in one of your social media posts, this would not be possible without volunteers. Can you, I mean, I think that that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you about how do we use our volunteers while we're in virtual? And could you maybe speak to that? Sure. 
Um, one, I'm a big fan of the library in, in face-to-face time or in virtual, getting everybody in there, right? And so when we think about the library, and I use that hashtag libraries beyond four walls, how do other people want to be part of a community? How does your admin want to see kids and have positive experiences? How, does, how do families sitting at home want their kids happy, want them to see other people in a safe way, and then also get to meet their teachers for the first time? Teachers are sad, y'all. We know that. We're not meant to be alone in cubicles. We're meant to be face-to-face with kids. And, and, and right now, that's not safe to do for many of us. So that means that it's an opportunity to come at curbside and talk to kids, talk to families, talk to t- like um, even sports teams come sometimes. We've had the band come once, right? I mean, so we're about forming that community. And I know many of us are like, Tuesday, I just can't ask my teachers to do one more thing. They're so tired. Y'all, this actually revs them up. Like I've had my my staff members come and say to me, Tuesday, that's the happiest I've been in a month, right? And, and I'm like, yeah, I know, right? Don't you want to come back? And they're like, I do, I do, Tuesday. So I think when we provide people purpose, right, and community, then we're there. And that is what libraries do. Some people get confused by that message. And I don't want to be real clear because I know this is a high school virtual programming session, but this is for all of my librarians out there because I learn a lot from my middle school and elementary. So I'm gonna say this, if you're sitting home and you're listening to this and you're like, well, she's gonna talk about stuff and I'm, I'm an academic librarian. No, no, you're not, no, you're not. Well, my library is academic. No, it's not, it's a tomb right now, okay? So it is a tomb. So if you right now are listening, you're like, mm-hmm, and it's making you uncomfortable, good. It should, at this point in time, it should because right now, You do not want to be a good librarian and that's where you go to die, okay? No, you are in this business for students, students first. And if you're sitting there and you're telling me, well, Tuesday, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have a lot of student programming in a community. My community is my teachers. No, it's not. No, it's not. You did not get hired for the number of teachers in your building because I can swear to you, there's a lot of schools out there with a lot of teachers with no librarians, right? You are in that building for kids. Students first. So if you look at your programming schedule right now and you look over your last week and it looks naked, you got to ask yourself, what are you doing? What are you doing with yourself? And you might be like, oh, Tuesday, last week was, you know, this week's break. But okay, fine. Then look at the week before that and the week before that. And if they're all looking similarly naked, we've got a problem, folks. We got a problem, but don't fret. Don't fret. I got some strategies, I got some tips, I got some tricks, I got some ideas, and I'm not saying I have the cornerstone of those ideas, but it's a way in. It's a way in, right? And if we're right now academic librarians, and we're not putting students first, students' voices first, then we are missing it. Houston, we've got a problem. Yeah. All right. So, friends, this won't come as any surprise, but um, I, I did want to uh, acknowledge something. And I, I you know, because I, I'm so excited to be learning about virtual high school programming. But I think that you were recognized for your 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 IRL or face to face programming. And I, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to mention the recognition which you received in October of 2019. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, I was uh, last year named Washington State Teacher Librarian of the Year um, by my colleagues and uh, other Washington State librarians who I definitely stand on the shoulders of and stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder with in terms of the work we're doing. So it is a huge honor. I am so, so grateful for their recognition and um, lucky because I work with some really hot librarians, y'all. Like, I'm lucky. And you all do too. We just got to find them, right? We just got to amplify that work we're all doing together. And we we shine brighter together. We really do. So how do we do that together? So if I freaked you out earlier by my by my um, little little rant, good. Let's get in it. Let's get it together. Well, and I, I have oftentimes hoped that this podcast would be a platform to showcase the best that we have to offer, but that the hope is that some of these award-winning programming uh, recommendations and strategies would then be implemented uh, across the, the country and around the world by school librarians who are hoping to have the same kind of impact that you have building your school community and and, and have that uh, success in, in their lives 
aren't learning spaces. So, you know, I think that the nice thing is, is that librarians, we, we aren't territorial. We, this is about mm-hmm. sharing and, and the, the rising uh, tide that lifts all boats, because the more people who learn about you and all of the award-winning strategies you've used in the past, you know, the better chance we have of not just strengthening our current uh, programming and, and uh, protecting our current programming, but hopefully promoting uh, programming that would expand uh, in, in the years to come. So I, I think that's certainly something that our, our advocacy, uh, you know, speaks to our need to advocate not just for ourselves, but for our spaces and our programs as well. So, you know, I do want to, um, to go back to this idea of library beyond four walls, because it, it came up in the last episode. And, you know, especially because, um, you know, that attitude when it comes to looking at what we currently are doing and what we could be doing to support our school communities, you know, we're going to be teaching remotely, many of us, for the foreseeable future. Districts are not giving us an end date. And so looking forward, I don't have to worry about pivoting anytime soon because unfortunately uh, the numbers aren't working in our favor. But how, you know, this whole idea of, Library Beyond Four four Walls, you saw that as a way to reach out across everybody in your school and and beyond. Right, right. And and I will say we have a very thriving community face to face. And so I did I and we're all we're all um, living off the the fumes of last year or whatever relationships we've had with teachers and kids and families. Right. We are. We're living on fumes right now and we're creating the best we can. But how do we do that in a way that continues to create community and excitement and joy because it's so rare these days? You want to be the purveyor of joy, right? And so how does that work and how do you name successes? So for us, we know right now, and and I want to say, first of all, um, the things I'm going to say next are all about synergy. So if you right now are like, Oh, well, I'm teach first grade or I'm I'm in an elementary school. And yeah, hang on, hang on, y'all. Like you can do this, you can do this. In fact, elementary libraries, you got it. In fact, when I say synergy, I mean any project that I talk about or a program I'm doing, um, I would highly recommend um partnering with your elementary, middle schools, um, people in other high school libraries, whoever, because at this point in time, any way you can connect to each other and make your programming bigger, deeper, stronger, um, is, is, is only going to serve you well and serve your students well, especially if you're feeder schools and you're sharing families. So um, I will say that in terms of synergy for me, I, at my school, um, typically would be doing programming at lunch. And last spring, I did program at lunch. It was hard, y'all. Some of us are doing it right now. You're competing with kids trying to get a, a snack in and not have their eyes on a, on a computer, right? So some, I am lucky enough this fall, I have an enrichment time. If I didn't have enrichment time, I would still be using my lunch time. Now, during enrichment time, I'm like, what can we do, y'all? What can we do? So um, oftentimes, yeah, I will come up with something and it will be out there. Out there, right? I don't even know what's going to work. So I need to hear, I need y'all to hear this. A lot of my stuff is unsuccessful, <laughs> Okay. I know you're like, wait, what? Why did I? Why am I tuning into this chick then? Because if it's unsuccessful, I don't need to hear from her. No, no, no. And I know we're all this brave before perfect stuff. Yeah, it sounds good. Feels like garbage, right? But, but here's the deal. Um, it does help. And you're asking kids to do this every day. We are literally asking kids to do things they don't know how to do. They're scared to do. Having to learn. You're asking kids to do it every day. You're now asking teachers to do it every day. You are a hypocrite if you don't do the same, okay? So other thing I need to say before I launch into my little action, y'all are sad about your numbers. You are, you are, you're sad, right? Me too, right? Two kids show up, you feel like a failure. You're not, okay? It's not the only success marker. It isn't, it isn't. It's one, and you can and you can review that and figure it out and do different times, maybe different poster, et cetera, et cetera. But do not look at your numbers as the only thing as your success. Okay. So I want to, I want to reiterate that because there are going to be times that you go all in and then it doesn't turn out the way you hoped and you're sad. And you know what? That's okay. Because last time I checked, kids feel that way all the time. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And we tell them to be resilient, right? Hi, we should be too. Let's model that for us right now. Okay. All right. Now 
my, back to my enrichment programming. I know, I took a little tour. Uh, <laughs> back to my enrichment programming. Uh, there are times that you're going to want to have kids in front of you. Teachers have a captive audience. You don't necessarily have that. Now, you may come in and co-teach with a teacher, which is awesome, right? That's a way to get kids. But they're very focused in high school and other grades on, do I have to do this? Is this a grade? <laughs> and you're like, mm, no, showing up at the library is not a grade. No, it's not. But you can form community. Mm, hard pass, Chambers. No. Okay? No. Here's why. Because what I've done, and y'all can do it too, is when I did orientations in the fall, I had a library interest survey. In the last podcast, I referenced this 14-step library orientation that kids could do synchronously or asynchronously. And in those steps, one of them is a library interest form, right? And it was an assignment, okay? So on our, on our, um, our um, learning management system, Schoology, I sent that out, right? So kids would have it as an assignment. They did it. I made it very user-friendly. I used Microsoft Office Forms. You kids would just click. It was not anonymous, okay? You need their names. You need to know who they are, okay? Do Are they interested in voraciously reading? Are they interested in movies? Do they want to make things? Um, are they interested in just forming community? Do they um, like comic books? What, what, are, what are you on about? What are they on about? Do they want to learn to bake? cook? Um, are they into um, building models? Are they Minecraft geeks? Like what's their jam? And then they just click on it. And then you have this treasure trove of kids names. Okay. Now you look at this list and you're overwhelmed, right? And you're like, Tuesday, I'm already tired, right? We're all tired, but you know, what's going to fill you up? Purposeful, meaningful, authentic relationships with kids. And if you listen to them and put them first, you will actually have that. So from this interest form, and I know you're like, Tuesday, it's December. I've already done my orientation. Pause the program. It's a new year. You could even say to your teachers, new orientation. <laughs> right? There are new things you could put in that interest form, including, including a video of an elementary student. Like if I was going to do this right now with my high school, I'd put in a video of an elementary student asking them if they'd be the reading buddy. Right? Because that would be a program. We have Reading Buddies as one of our programs. So I could embed a video of a first grader, which by the way I do, um, and then have them with little cakey Nutella hands, which happened last week, um, and asking, will you be my reading buddy? And that be a program that a high schooler's little heart will melt for and do, right? I could have a middle schooler be like, man, I'm really freaked out about high school next year. Will you be my mentor? And that could be one of the, one of the things the students click on in high school that, yeah, I'm willing to sign up to do that. And that now is a program. Now, obviously, the amount of stuff I just listed, I, I couldn't do all that by myself. That's, that's too much. Fair. But I can do it with my teachers at my school. And this goes back to coalition building. So after my interest form came out, I went to my ASB and I looked like what clubs are already involved, like already started. Kids are already running virtually, right? Can they be plugged in? Does this advisor and this president of the ferocious feminist club know that these seven freshmen really want to get dialed in? No, they had no idea. So they're like, oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I'm like, oh, by the way, can you read this book? And can I come in and do a book talk about it? Right? Like, oh, can I connect you in this way? And so then I become this source, right? And then, so I just, and then some we didn't have advisors for. So I'm like, hey, teachers, who wants to run a cookbook club? Hey, teachers, who's doing D&D? &D? Hey, teachers. So that's how I got a lot of my synergy going. And that's how I got a lot of my um, enrichment going. And, you know, I, I think that somebody is sitting here going, great, it's December. You know, why didn't I know about this back in uh, September? And and I will say, I, I know I've said it before on earlier episodes, 
But, you know, the fact is that it's never too late to start something. And there's no reason why when we start something, it has to arbitrarily start at the beginning of the school year. That puts a great deal of of undue burden on anyone who says, okay, well, if you're going to get it, you better get it right. And you better get it at the beginning of the year because you're never going to have another chance. And I remember that was a, a, a steep learning curve for me, especially when I found myself struggling with some issues regarding classroom management because we get entire classes coming down to the library and uh, I, you learn very quickly that what might work for your littles isn't going to work for your, your uh, upper L. So friends, never be afraid to start something new uh, in the middle of the year because just because it just doesn't fit your, your idea of when things should start. And so I, I really do love that idea. And I, I love that you are soliciting this kind of buy-in from your, your audience and your, your, your participants and your student body, because it really does help guide and define, not just define your, your programming, but it also guides your programming moving forward, whether you are virtual or you are face-to-face. So, um, you know, I agree. I, right now, my, I myself am using some surveys now, mine are for littles, but, you know, we're using... For, them for things to, that we're buying, things that we're offering, things that we're providing mm-hmm. at curbside. Um, what's going on the cart when I when I fill my carts for curbside, and uh, it, right. it certainly right. does help. And and a lot of that we do through Schoology because it's a way that we can reach our our students. You know, I'm I'm curious. You know, you also use uh, Destiny Discover, mm-hmm. and can I? And I I said last week I, I don't use Destiny Discover because we don't have it, but. Is there something that you're doing differently now because you are your program is virtual that you didn't do before um, using Destiny Discover? Absolutely. Um, and and for those of you out there who are like, I have Destiny Discover and it's not getting any play chambers. Uh, yeah, I get it. And and I want to emphasize, it's never going to be a good time, right? Like if you're like, oh, it's the end and it's going to be break. It's not a good time. Oh, it's we just got back and everybody's busy. Oh, Destiny Discover, it's January and I, we launched it in September. Like y'all, like we didn't even, high schoolers would just come to the table and be like, where's this book, Chambers? Right, like that was the extent of their library, like, you know, prowess of searching for books. Like point me in the genre, Chambers. Like that was it. So Destiny Discover now, how we're using it is so radically different. One, we're not doing the classic version. We're doing Destiny Discover. So that automatically launches on kids' uh, screens. Two, I made a bit.ly link. Because if I'm asking kids to do 9,000 clicks, I've lost them in two. And that's, and that's with a 17-year-old. Don't even talk to me about a kindergartner, right? Okay. So like, let's be real. How many obstacles can you remove? And if we're really talking about your families that are furthest from educational justice, right, which should be at the center of your work, if you if they are already have obstacles in their way and getting to your library catalog is one of them, we have missed it. We have really missed it. So I made my library catalog a bit.ly link. Learn from my mistakes, folks. Don't use any capital letters. It's case sensitive. So anyway, so I, I'm giving you gold right now. OK, so um, I make mine. It just says BHS holds. Don't make it fancy. Don't stop the fancy, okay? Just make it your name. Make it your school's name. Make it make sure yours is in another school, though, because I kind of ran into that, too. So then you, we made that short bit.ly link, and kids just put that in. Why is that important? Because everything runs through the library. Y'all heard me talk about community and how many classes and courses and people and events. That all goes through Destiny, Discover, and it all goes through Schoology. So the two actually mirror one another, right? And so at the top of my... Destiny Discover page, which you're all welcome to look at. On the left is a little video of me and a little talk about me and my face, right? Which is the same thing you're going to see on Schoology, which is the same thing you're going to see on my Instagram account, which is what most of our clubs are running through in my high school, which is the same thing you're going to see on my Twitter page if you're an educator. FYI, kids don't really use Twitter. Okay, so, so, newsflash. Uh, So then you're going to see this sort of like similar way to access me, right? And to access the catalog. When you, on that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side are these things called learning links. That's how they have it set up. Now, you can go to every Destiny Discover training you want. I actually suggest them because there's all sorts of ways to make your Destiny Discover page very hot, right? I haven't got there, so know this. But I have made the learning links valuable enough that when I co-teach with a class, when I run a program through, When I have an event that's happening, I try to have it show up at the top. So right now, 
we have a group called Eager Beaver Readers. You have them too. They're just not beavers, right? They're the kids that are voracious readers, right? They may not be accessing your circ stats maybe now, but they're reading books like demons, right? So who are they? Get their names from your, from your teachers. Find out who they are. Invite them. Have them come to an enrichment time. Have them come. All they do is talk about books. Not even the same one. Books they like. Show them the state list. Ask them on Destiny Discover if they'll rate any of the books. Will they give any reviews? Can they write any reviews that when kids go to the catalog, they can then find them? And then, do, and then what we did is we had one of our library leaders who's an eager beaver reader create a beaver reader book bingo, right? And so they just go through and, and they're trying to hit all the squares of the book bingo over a break. So when we come back for curbside, which we try to have all of our programming center around curbside, so there's this natural cadence to what we're doing and when we can see each other and be excited about, right? And there's always beginnings and ends to things, right? Um, then that shows up as a learning link, that beaver, that beaver bingo. And that's at the top of Destiny Discover. Also up there are my beaver reader lists, which is what we launch in the summer. So the eager beaver readers pick the list. And it's not just students, y'all. Some of your teachers are also readers. They wanna be in on this, right? This isn't about grading. This is about being around kids and having an amazing experience talking about books. And so, and real talk about, hey, I'm in a book slump. For kids that have never been in a book slump, this is a dark, dark place, y'all, right? Um, and what do you do when, when, you, when you don't like the book, um, but you liked the movie? And what do you do? Like all those conversations. So the Eager Beaver Readers reflects our state reading list. It reflects our, our, our school reading list. It reflects what kids want to be reading and not reading because they have direct influence on what I put in the library, what I need more copies of, right? Um, and then they themselves um, write my some of my Instagram posts, write my reviews, share and amp about it. They then go into classes, right, and talk about the books because I co-teach with a bunch of teachers. And so I'll be like, oh, Maylee's in here. Maylee, why don't you share? Right. And Maylee goes off about this book that we read. So um, I definitely think, and that, and that is just one piece of programming, right? Cause that's your voracious readers, but it's an avenue or an entry point for kids. And especially if you have kids that are maybe graphic novel readers and maybe that's not your strength, right? But gosh, you need it. You need it. It's gorgeous work out there. So invite those kids in, invite those teachers in, right? And they get to be in that space together and they develop this identity together, and then they're serving the community. So it feels really, really good. Well, and I think you hit upon a really important point that, you know, when we think about book clubs, we shouldn't limit it to the idea that you are singularly focused on a, a, a piece of, of literature, one piece of literature. That book club can be a, a group of people who want to talk about books. And, and, and I, I, I certainly got that inclination when I, I interviewed Kitty Feldy for virtual book clubs, because when you are struggling to make sure that we, we are reading books, you know, this idea that we all have to be reading the same book does present a bit of a challenge for, for us when we're trying to to support our students remotely. So I love the idea of expanding this idea of, of speaking about the joy of reading and the struggle of reading um, and all aspects of reading in a club. Let me ask you, speaking about the love of reading and access, um, you and I share a love of Hoopla and Sora. And um, you mentioned in our last episode about hustling books. And I, I have officially not yet met somebody who referred to what we do as hustling books. But I, I find it both um, a clever uh, way to describe what we do, but, uh, you know, incredibly enticing because I'd like to sort of dissect this idea. But, you know, how do you, um, you using Hoopla and Sora, how do you hustle books when you are working with uh, digital resources? Well, there's a, there's a couple ways, right? Um, there is the tried and true method of um, I have high school teachers who want to do a whole class novel right? They're like, give me my Shakespeare, give me, my. and I'm like, Arr. okay. So I'm like, what else we got people? And you know what? This is a unique time because for the first time in decades for some of them, they're like, uh, Tuesday, um, I can't really get those books to kids. I'm like, nope, nope, you can't. So, right. So let's look at some other options 
Or if you are, and, and to be said, Kindred is a fantastic novel, but how, how's that going for you? Is everybody getting it done? Of course not. They didn't get it done on a good day. And that was in face to face. Okay. So then I'm like, Hey y'all, let's all kick it on over to Hoopla and let's check the graphic novel version of Kindred. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. And they're like, Oh, that's actually really good. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah it is. Yeah, it is. And so any opportunities I can make inroads with academic opportunities and selling to the teachers, my teacher's minds are now blown, right? I got a, uh, my, my 10th graders all take world lit. So we went through and just me and my Seattle public librarian shouts out to collaboration with your public librarians. Um, right. Right. Uh, I, I went through all of Hoopla and found all of the international, international graphic novels. So what are ways that we can see perspective using graphic novels that we can actually use that as a, as a launching point for our students? And Hoopla is no weights right now. Everyone has access. Y'all can be reading. And there's, there's, they're quick, right? There's, there's, a, there's a, a immediate gratification going on. So that's one of the ways I hustle. 10th grade is world lit. 11th grade is American lit. And we're doing the concept of what is an American? So then I went through and curated all my graphic novels on all the different ways you can attack that and combat that and wrestle with that idea. So that's a hustle right there. So when you go into class, you see Miss McKenna's class, you have a whole list of hoopla books that I have put the, put the links to in folders in Schoology that reflect all the different genres. Because here's the thing. If I say to you, here, we'd like to give you all the list for um, East African uh, books. And they'll be like, mm hmm Okay. But if I say to you, hey, 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 check it out. Here's all the horror books. Look at all these, right? And they're like, ah! right? And they're all in there looking for horror books. And they happen to be written by really brilliant people from all over the world. Then your perspective changes and you got to read the kind of book you wanted because let's face it, student choice is their voice, right? You, you, they actually enter that way. So I'm hustling with academically assigning work in ways that makes kids want to read, excited to read, and staff feel like, oh my God, I didn't know this resource was even available. This is awesome, right? I can now have this forever. That's a silver lining. We now have these curated lists. P.S. If you want to reach out to me, I'll share them. Uh, but um, you have these, these lists that are fantastic. Now, on top of that, right, I already have that library interest form that I, I mentioned. So I have a bunch of staff members who are fired up, right? Mr. Furman is one of the greatest humans on this planet. I hope he listens to this podcast. Uh, he, um, last summer, was like, Tuesday, let's have a pride book club. And in response, one wonderful student said to me, she goes, um, do you think we could do it next year and not just celebrate gay people during June? <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing like a high schooler to give it to you. Okay. And I was like, mm -hmm, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. Okay. So Mr. Furman and I got really excited. We got a grant. We got some books and, and print books. But then we're like, you know what? We got, there are times in between our curbsides, kids need books. And there's all these beautiful and graphic novels especially have really beautiful queer lit, right? They're great, great, great work being done. And so we started using some of that. So that's a way I hustle books through the Pride Book Club. Um, I have a teacher named Mr. Lee, also fantastic man. He loves comic books. I mean, like if he was trapped on a, on a, like a desert island, he would just have be stacks of comic books, right? So this man loves them. And so we now do comic book club every Friday. And there's this way we do it because it always is about the hero's journey. It's always about the villain. It's always about the great reveal. And let's look at the art. And I don't care if you are a first grader or you are a 12th grader. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad person? Why, what, what, what were you surprised by? And, and oh, what's your favorite art? What's it's a page that you're like, oh, right? That is the template. And every week we do that, kids pick their favorite pieces, right? And then we've started, we actually have some middle school librarians who've started attending our comic book club, right? And then some of our comic book club students are now mentors and going and starting them in, in middle schools. So our goal is that eventually when all this ends, right, y'all, I know we're all thinking about it that we will still have this amazing, beautiful environment where we've created this ecosystem of kids that love comic books, love graphic novels, love to read, right? That's all we care about, love to read. 
and that we have created this together. So that's how I hustle. I got other things I do, but those are off the top of my head. Well, and it seems like, you know, you know, I think all too often it, it, librarians see this as very overwhelming because it, we feel like it's all on us. And what we need to do is tap the excitement that, that, individual teachers have and then see how we can support the, that excitement that they particularly have if they're going to uh, be sponsoring a club, or maybe a club that doesn't exist yet, and, and be like, you know, look, this is a great idea. I'm here to help you if you need, uh, you know, a co-sponsor or you need somebody to help you with your materials. Well, and Amy, I want to emphasize many times librarians are like, but my LA teachers just won't respond. Yeah, they're not. Suck it up, buttercup, because that's not your only game in town. OK, so oftentimes we go to the same people and we're frustrated and they're overwhelmed or quite frankly, they just don't want to do what you want to do. OK, <laughs> makes me mad, too. OK, but here's the deal. You have a whole host of people who are hot to hustle books with you. You've got an admin. OK, you got an admin. What are they doing? Are they readers? Well, make them readers. Get them in there. I once had an admin who told me I will not out this person, but they're like, yeah, I don't really read. I was like, and you can sit in front of kids and say that? Is that okay? Do you say that in front of families? And his face was like, <gasps> that admin now reads two to four books a month, young adult. So you want to talk about hustling? Get your admin in a book club with you. Get them reading books sitting next to kids. I'll, t- I'll tell you, it's mighty nice to be an admin and not have to do discipline and get to talk about literature, right? Get to see kids excited, right? And you're like, I don't know if they'll go for that. You don't know what they're going to go for right now. The whole world is strange, right? You, you're doing stuff you never thought you would do. Really, the world is weird right now. Embrace it. Invite your admin. Invite your band teacher. Invite your gym teacher, right? Like people that I'm like, oh, you like to do that? Fascinating. They pull a whole different group of kids into your library. Libraries beyond four, four walls can look like the kids who are in uh, Miss Lalonde's class who love to cook and bake. Right. And then we're on Seattle Public Library's um, um, Libby accounts looking for cookbooks. Right. And you're comparing all the different recipes. And then you get to we've got a baking club run by one of our L.A. social studies teachers where kids watch the British baking show together and bake food together. They're so happy. They're so happy. So if you are like, oh, that's a lot. Chambers, that's a lot. No. Not, not if you're not if you do it with others. You can do this. You gotta invite people in, and you gotta make your work transparent, right? You gotta let because this this year more than any other, I've had people, and I'm not shy. This is probably obvious, right? I'm not shy. This more than any other, I've had people be like, I I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't know. Let's just go out of the library. I'm like, yeah, because you're normally in your room. You shut the door. Doors open. You got no door. Ha ha ha! Right? We're together now. We're together now. Let's keep doing this. And so it's been really, that's the silver lining, folks. And we just got to hold on to those, right? The silver lining is you have an opportunity to connect with teachers in ways that they may not have been open to before in subject matter that you maybe never even considered, right? To try things that they don't know are going to work and you don't either, but you're willing to do it together. And so, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've had a librarian say to me, oh, I didn't, you know, I don't really want to do that. They don't want to hear from me. I'm just like an old lady, right? And I'm like, shut up. Okay, you need to shut, stop the nonsense. Here's why. They're open to anything. And kids will give you grace. Kids will give you grace in a way adults never will. They are kinder now than they have been in, I don't know, years. So if you were sitting there and you're letting your ego or your insecurities or, or I don't know, sheer depression get to you, I get it. But I just had this talk with a science teacher, right? And she's like, your input and output output are very similar. What are you putting in is reflective of what you're putting out. So are you actually doing this with kids? Are you having student voice at the center? Are you connecting with others in purposeful, authentic, meaningful ways? If so, your output is gonna look very different, right? If you are having a tough time getting up and it's, it's, it's a struggle, I get it. But then let's change the input so we can change the output. And that's hers. You know, I, I do want to tie uh, tie a little connection here to what you were just talking about, because we were talking about how we use Schoology to support our, our programming virtually. And, you know, now that you just mentioned, you know, 
approaching teachers with these ideas. And, you know, one of the things my administrators asked me to do uh, when I talked about how I just, I'm hesitant because I don't want to overwhelm our teaching staff with a flurry of, you know, this deluge of, of information. And, you know, I found that one of the best ways to target my, my uh, uh, the people I, I send information to is I join their Schoology grade level groups. So um, friends, oftentimes we think of Schoology as just being a platform for students to learn, but a lot of districts are using our learning platforms to uh, create groups for teachers to support one another. And I know, especially in my community, in my uh, district, we're using grade level teams and I've asked if I can join those. And so I get to, I share a lot of my tips and tricks, especially with using like Hoopla for mm-hmm. our reading groups. Um, I've used that. That was the most recent one that I used. And I can tell because sometimes I'll get an occasional thank you. And sometimes I'll get a, hey, Amy, can you remind me of my library card number? Because, yeah. and I know <laughs> what it means is they they watch my Hoopla video on Schoology and now they want to use Hoopla with their students. But, yep. you know, that whole part where they thank me for doing that doesn't really need to happen because they're now, I can tell that they're watching yeah. my videos. And mm-hmm. and that really is huge. Yep. But, you know, you're using these combination of of digital platforms to support our, our, our learning communities remotely. So I, I really love that. I, I need to hear about how, you know, it's not unusual for high schools to uh, rely on student volunteers and student, uh, a team of, of student, you, you call them library leaders. Everybody's got names for their, their, their students who work in the library with them face to face IRL. But how mm-hmm. are you employing this you know, team in a way, uh, you know, remotely that helps you in, in your job, uh, currently. Well, and, and let me say this, I came from a middle school background, right? I have 21 years experience. When I taught middle and was a librarian at middle school, we had TAs at high school. I know all the high school librarians out there are scoffing because you really don't have TAs at high school because they need credits. They don't get enough credit on their high school graduation transcript by being a TA. Also, college is like, hmm, TA, huh? Okay, so oftentimes students who would be motivated to be your TA at high school level can't. They're too busy taking AP classes. They're in IB courses. I mean, like, it's just they're on fire, right? So oftentimes you have to figure out how do I capture those students who to graduate, at least in Seattle School District, you need 60 hours of community service, right? Community service can look like a whole lot of different things. But community service that builds community seems like the point, right? And so I reached out to students because on the interest form that I mentioned earlier, I asked students who wants to be a library leader. Now, I had already been co-teaching with some kids and they were like, all right, Chambers, now I thought I was going to get the voracious readers. Nope. <laughs> I, got, I got the kids who were like not identifying as readers, but like me or like the vibe, right? Like, like the library back in the day. And then they got all these ninth graders to join because they were cool and they were welcoming and they were kind. And they're all different kinds of people from all different groups. And we just show up on Tuesdays and one of my students leads it. And then we just talk about what projects we're doing to actually help our school be more connected. So we have our ASB and by, um, like rep show up every Tuesday. So she's there just being like, hey, 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 we're already doing a spirit week or hey, 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 we're on this and we're doing that or, you know, we're making a video about this, right? But we are the ones who are like, oh, well, it seems like people are doing really nice things. And we looked at another high school in our area, Lincoln High School has been doing gratitude posts. And then two girls were like, you know what? I love to use Canva. And one girl's like, oh, I like to use Adobe Spark. Next thing you know, they're making gratitude po- posts, doing graphic design. And, and they're now, we're asking teachers and community members and students to send in gratitude posts. And those are showing up on Instagram, right? Parents are writing about teachers. Admin are writing about students. I mean, like, so it's this beautiful time. And they're doing it. I'm not doing it. They're doing it, right? So it's a way to create community. They're doing um, a BHS song list, right? Um, a playlist on uh on Spotify, which we just sent out. It was made by a parent and a library leader together. And they made bops and flops. And so the, you can really feel the parents' influence on some of those songs. Anyway, and, and they're great, right? Uh, we have the bingo boards from movies to books. We have, oh, and recently uh, we talked about creating a virtual library experience. So 
I said, yo, 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 like, wouldn't it be fun if kids who have never, students who have never been to the library got to virtually be here, y'all, kind of like a game, right? So you come in the door, we have this ginormous beaver made out of wood, so they'd have to enter kind of like, and, and so they're all playing among us, right? So it's like, you know how when you enter and you have like tasks you have to complete? What if you have to complete these tasks? And one of them is you go to the right and there's Miss, Miss Wood is there, our assistant. And she says, hello to you. And there's a little video you click on. And she says, hello. And then there's like a little Easter egg, right? So either you go right where we, make, where we do our puzzles or you go left to the makerspace or you go to the genre stacks. And then what if you all made me some videos and then you picked your favorite books or stories or events or whatever that relate to that genre or that area of the library. And then you pop up, right? And then you're part of this virtual library space because no one wants to hear me talk for, okay, y'all, y'all are signed up for this. So maybe, but mostly 17 and 18 year olds do not want to hear me talk, right? Um, so if, so, and I'm not gonna lie to you. Everyone's like, how are you going to do this chamber on a very low level? I was like, well, I could make a Bitmoji classroom and people could click it. And, but my site, my computer science teacher's like, Hey, 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 hold up. I got a whole bunch of kids who know how to make websites, right? Chambers. And they need leadership points. What if they get with you and they help build this? I'm like, Hey, so they're building it on unity. So we're in the, we're in the midst of planning that, creating that, um, kids are super kids that, we, and, and let me be clear too. Every week I have kids joining project programs that they've never joined before. So if I was like, oh, I guess that's all the library leaders I'm going to get. Now I had four new ones this week. I was like, what, what's happening? Right. They're like, I, I heard about it on Schoology. I thought it'd be cool. Right. Like, so do not give up because randos will show up and you'd be like, well, are you into this? And they're like, yeah, this is this 360 business. Sounds fun. So I want to say that that's our, we have not finished it. We have just started the planning stages, but they are so excited about the concept of sharing what our library can mean, both virtually and in person, and how those two interact, that, that we're already planning on times outside of library leader times to do that. So I just, I'm very excited about that. That's our latest 360 video library leader um, adventure. Uh, and I'll, I'll keep you posted on what that sounds like or what it looks like and what we come up with with the name, but that's that's kind of that's one of our latest projects. Well, and and friends, I'm hoping um, our our show notes are are going to grow exponentially. <laughs> I have, I have a feeling between now and when when we go into post um, that we'll be adding a few more links to the show notes. So, friends, um, you know, Tuesday, I'd love to to ask you. Um, you have a first chapter Friday program. Mm -hmm. Is that a continuation of something you did pre pandemic? So, so I will say this pre-pandemic, we had our beaver reader list, right? I would, I would talk up that list. I would have teachers read from the list all summer. I gave kids buttons from lists when we were in real, real life. Um, I would have those be the books that I book talked and we have a spreadsheet to make sure that it's representative of own voices and that the students who, who oftentimes do not identify as readers were reflected in the book choices on that list. Um, so that was all prior. Then COVID hit. So then I started doing, at the time it was first chapter Thursdays because I had too much going on on Fridays. So then I started reading and then I had um, staff members read for first chapters and then I had students read for me. So they'd read the first chapter of whatever book from the Beaver Reader list. And then lately, and this is, it's hot off the presses folks. Um, one of our elementary, shout outs to elementary, had been having their, um, different teachers in their school read a chapter as mystery readers. <laughs> and so I asked um, uh, some of my admin and some of my other teachers if they'd be willing to read a chapter. And especially like highly visible people, like my choir teacher, my principal, my gym teacher, my, my botany teacher, right? And ask if they disguise their hands and face, like witness protection program kind of action, right? And read a chapter. And so that's what we've um, been doing. We send it out at Schoology. I send it out on my Instagram. I let parents know. And I can tell because it's on YouTube and I can see how many times it's been watched. Now, some go better than others, but that's been a way that I also hustle books and get stories that kids may not have picked up, picked up. And then I get teachers like, oh, that book is really good. Can I, can I check it out? And then they're the ones that share that book. And so it's not just me talking about these gorgeous books in our library, but all of my staff is, is aware of what we're doing and, and kind of on about it. You know, I, I love 
all these great ideas. You mentioned movie night, and I'm trying to figure out, is this something that you've been able to continue uh, during your your pandemic uh, outreach? Yes. And I will say that part of this is on the shoulders of my students because they were really fired up. And so we would try to match whatever we were reading with whatever we were watching. So um, history teachers, actually, we watched, um, we watched 13. And then, um, and then we watched, we're actually watching um, Black Panther this Friday with our comic book club. And we're inviting all the future comic book clubs from around the Seattle to come and watch it with us. And then um, we invited the comic book um, uh, store manager to come and show up too. And so he's going to be virtually there and he's like, Hey, right. And so we're going to get him, give him an opportunity to, to amp his, his storefront and also to tell people, Hey, if you stop by, you can get these gifties. So, right. And so it's this way to form community with, with literature and with movies and kids recently, I went into a class thinking I was all that in a bag of chippies. And I was like, Hey y'all, what thinking that everyone wants my read alouds. They're so good. Right. Uh, and I'm like, what read aloud do you want from me? I'm pretty good at those, right? They all were like, mm, yeah, what? And and instead, Miss Chambers, can you show us what movies, um, if I binge this movie series or show series, can you show me which book is like that? Like that's like overwhelmingly when I ask their opinion, they're like, well, oh, Chambers, I'd rather have this. So um, part of what we're doing, part of how I'm shifting or changing for this this time late late in the season and then early January is I'm making everything connected to their podcasts, to their movies, to what they're listening to for music, right? How are the ways that I'm bringing all those other multi multimodal events in their lives that they don't identify as library or literacy, even though it is right. How do I make that part of my programming and how do I make that part of what work I do with the students? So yes, we're doing movies. One is this Friday. Um, and we're hoping that, that it just keeps going on because Wonder Woman's coming out. And so, you know, that's a comic book too. So we're pretty excited about it. So Tuesday, I have to ask, because somebody in the audience, listening audience right now wants to know, how did you uh, make sure that your licensing was such that you could broadcast? And what platform did you use to broadcast this in a way that you could support it uh, on, on your from, from a tech perspective? So, and, and I will say, this is the tricky, tricky. And so if you have other ways to do it, please let me know. So the one that I, probably the easiest one was when we um, used Netflix and it was Netflix Party. It's since, I think, changed to Movie Party. And so at that point in time, people who attended that one, which was not for credit, that one was just, um, it was literally, you had to have Netflix, right? So that one, you don't have any problem. And the same for Hulu. So that's what we're doing right now. So I am actually not in charge of the Black Panther one. So I actually don't know what platform, but I'll keep you posted and let you know what he's using. I know right now it's on Disney Plus, but you have to have Disney Plus to actually see it. So right, so you're not broadcasting it on no. your on your uh, feed. You are no, you, are, no, you no, have no. the watch party, yes, but, and people yes. are watching from their yes. home uh, home theaters. Yes. <laughs> and uh, with, yes. It's our home theater now because that's oh, as good as it gets. Right. Um, you know, Tuesday, this has been an absolute joy. I um, I stalk you on cyber, uh, <laughs> and uh, friends, I, I stalk you on cyber. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you would learn a, a tremendous. It's, what's very helpful for me is to see the pictures of the things you've talked about. Because when I did my homework for this episode, um, I stalked you and then realized I needed more information because these pictures were so incredibly appealing from a, a, a programming perspective to see so many people involved in supporting you and this program and, and reaching out to this community of yours. And you get such an intimate picture or portrait because you provided these visuals for us. I'm, I'm hoping our conversation has filled in some of those oh, details. I hope so too. And I want to say this, and I know you have to go, Amy, because I know you got curbside coming. But uh, I want to make sure that people understand, like, if you are not doing social media, and I have a whole group of people like, oh, yeah, I don't do social media. No, social media is doing you. OK, and you cannot sit there and have a conversation with a, a high school student and say, be part of be part of change, be part of positive change and not expect social media to be part of it. OK, so if you are not currently on social media, it's not going away. You're not your great great grandparents saying that email thing. That's a fad. No. OK, so you need to get on social media, even if it's just to lurk at first. Right. 
You need to get on Twitter for, for adult curation purposes. You don't need to follow Kim Kardashian. Okay, y'all, you don't need to do that. But you do need to follow educators that you want to hear their voice, specifically educators of color, right? Librarians of color. When you mention KC Boyd, she is no joke. Erica Long, no joke. Kristen Sierra in Tacoma, Washington, no joke, okay? I, in fact, I, later Amy, will send you a list of, of people of color, BIPOC, educators, specifically librarians, who are blowing it up, and every chance you get to watch what they're doing, learn from them, understand more, we become better. And so even if you are not creating personal, like new, authentic, original content for right now, because you're overwhelmed, okay, but you better get on there and you better see what's going on. Because if you sit here and you're like, oh, like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, you do. Learn from people. You ask kids to do it all day long. So get on social media, get on Twitter. My Twitter account is Beaver Readers. My Instagram is Beaver Readers BHS. I would love to um, share a list of the people that I follow. you got a lot of great people doing a lot of great things. Tuesday, I, I know this is not the last we've heard from you. I want to uh, encourage everyone to visit our show notes. I want to uh, wish you a very happy holidays oh, and, a, and a, you. You a very wonderful new year. And I know, friends, how about I promise that uh, this is not the last time we've heard from Tuesday Chambers. Thank you. It has been an absolute delight to be able to talk with Tuesday Chambers, not once, but twice in two weeks, and to be able to share this conversation with everyone today. I want to make sure you check out all the resources mentioned in our episode, which are linked in our show notes. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. And if you really like listening today, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcatcher so you will never miss an episode. Today's episode is the last of 2020. Our January lineup is well underway, and I can promise you fun, informative conversations dedicated 100% to running a school library. If you have a chance over this holiday season, I'd love to hear from you. Your feedback and episode suggestions give this podcast direction and relevance to school librarians across the United States and around the world. I'd like to wish you and everyone a very happy and safe holiday season and a healthy start to the new year. I can't wait to return in a few weeks to share these conversations, perspectives, resources, and strategies. Stay well, friends. Mm -hmm.